Lesson 6 of Private Sex Advice to Women This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Private Sex Advice to Women by R. B. Armitage Lesson 6 The Science of Eugenics No one who keeps in even only fair touch with the affairs of the world of today can have failed to notice the frequent mention of the term eugenics in the newspapers, magazine, and books of the hour. And yet, many persons seem to be in doubt as to the meaning and use of the term, some thinking that it refers to some new ism or ology, or perhaps to some new and strange doctrine concerning the relations of the sexes. In view of this fact, the writer has thought it well to give the readers of this book a brief, though somewhat comprehensive, view of the general subject of eugenics. Eugenics, sometimes known as the science of parenthood, has well been styled the new science, for it has forced itself into public notice within the past ten or fifteen years whereas before that time it was practically unknown to the general public. At the present time, some of the world's greatest thinkers have spoken or written on the subject, and many regard it as one of the most vital branches of human research, endeavor, and study, for the future of the race is involved in the solution of its problems. In its general phase of race betterment, eugenics is receiving the attention of statesmen, sociologists, and patriots. In its particular phases, the earnest attention, interest, and study of men and women who wish offsprings of the best quality obtainable. The spirit of eugenics may be expressed in the words of Dr. G. Stanley Hull, president of Clark University, who has said, Our duty of all duties is to transmit the sacred torch of life undiminished, and, if possible, a little brightened to our children. This is the chief end of men and women. All posterity slumbers in our bodies as we did in our ancestors. The basis of the new biological ethics of today and of the future is that everything is right that makes for the welfare of the yet unborn, and all is wrong that injures them, and to do so is the unpardonable sin, the only one nature knows. End of quote. That phase of eugenics which has brought the new science more prominently before the public mind and which has enrolled on its roster the names of some of the world's most eminent scientists, sociologists, and writers, the phase of race betterment from the standpoint of sociology, has led many to believe that eugenics is confined to that phase, and is but a movement toward the successful breeding of the human race on a universal scale. To many, such a movement, while deemed commendable and desirable, nevertheless lacks the appeal of the heart and affections. It seems to be of the head alone. But when such persons are brought to their realization that eugenics is also a movement to promote the bearing of children, to enable each mated couple to bring forth perfect offspring, then the heart is enlisted as a co-worker with the head. The sociological phase of eugenics, the phase of race culture in general, is being vigorously advanced by societies and organizations in various parts of the world, the parent organization being the Eugenics Education Society of London, England. Dr. C. W. Salibi, one of those prominent in the works of the said society, has the following to say concerning the work of that organization. 
the Eugenics Education Society exists to uphold the ideal of parenthood as the highest and most responsible of human powers, to proclaim that the racial instinct is therefore supremely sacred, and its exercise through a marriage for the service of the future the loftiest of all privileges. It stands for a transfigured sentiment of parenthood which regards with solicitude not child and grandchild only but the generations to come hereafter fathers of the future creating and providing for the remote children that which too many schools of thought and practice have derided of defiled it seeks to elevate and ennoble Parenthood on the part of the diseased, the insane, the alcoholic, where these conditions promise to be transmitted, must be denounced as a crime against the future. In these directions, the society stands for active legislation, and for the formation of that public opinion which legislation, if it is to be effective, must express. Parenthood on the part of the worthy must be buttressed guided and extolled the society stands for the education of the young regarding the responsibility and holiness of the racial function of parenthood End of quote. the eugenists hold that in the near future our children looking back upon the present and the past state of indifference and neglect concerning the important subject of bearing and rearing of children will experience the same horror that we now feel when we look back upon the indifference to the horrors of human slavery, imprisonment for debt, cruelty toward prisoners, treatment of the insane, executions for trivial offenses, etc., on the part of our ancestors. Our descendants will deem it almost inconceivable that we, their ancestors, could have been so blind and criminally negligent. But, as leading eugenists have pointed out, the new science does not confine its attention to the subject of preventing measures, important as they are. It also directs its attention to the constructive phase of the subject, that is, the production of better children. While eugenics strives to prevent the unfit from flooding the race with unfit progeny, it at the same time strives to educate the race so that the fit may bear and rear better offsprings. It is not sufficient merely to eliminate the unfit. We must also improve and still further render fit the fit members of the race. The fit must not be allowed to remain merely the fit. We must evolve a fitter and ever move onward toward the realization of the ideal of the fittest. We must not only strive to eliminate the beast in the race of men, we must also aid the race to unfold in the direction of the superman. The eugenists know that much of the talk concerning race suicide is not only futile and uncalled for, but it also, in a sense, misleading and actually dangerous. The real danger of race suicide comes not from the decreasing birth rate, but from the excessive, ignorant, and unscientific bearing and rearing of children by unfit parents. It is not so much a matter of how many children are born, as of how they are born, what kind of children they are, and how they are reared physically, mentally, and morally, and how many survive. It is not so much that the lower death rate be avoided, says the eugenist, as it is that the higher death rate be overcome. The intelligent stock breeder grasps the scientific law of the eugenists when he endeavors to produce the best young, and then to take care of them that they survive and reach a healthy maturity. To the eugenist, it's not so much a question of more, but of better, not so much a question of quantity as of quality, not so much a question of production, 
but of conservation and preservation. Dr. Salibi refers to the death rate of London, which is but 16 to the thousand, as compared to that of Bombay, which is 79 to the thousand. He adds, It is asserted that in many large Indian cities the infant mortality approaches one half of all the children born. What it amounts to in such cities as Canton and Pekin, we can only surmise with horror. Unless it be supposed by bishops and others, then that a peculiar value attaches to the production of a baby shortly to be buried, the suggestion evidently is the same as to which every humanitarian and social and patriotic impulse guides us, namely the reduction of the death rate and especially of infant mortality hence the eugenists and the episcopal bench may join hands so far as the reduction of the death rate is concerned and the only persons with whom a practical quarrel remains are those who applaud the mother who boasts that she has buried twelve End of quote. The eugenists urge that if the principles applied to plant life by that master of his science, Luther Burbank, were applied to the production and rearing of young human life, in a few generations we should have a race so far advanced beyond the present average, so as to be almost godlike by comparison. But this means a far different thing from the ideals of merely more children. It requires the manifestation of the ideal of better children, well-born, carefully reared, well-nourished, and scientifically educated. And this rearing, nourishing, and education must not be confined to the physical part of the child's nature. It must proceed along the threefold line of physical, mental, and moral culture. The eugenists have been actively concerned with the question of the prevention of the transmission of undesirable qualities to offspring. They have held that while crime is more frequently rather the result of evil environment than of criminal heredity, nevertheless, there is a large class of children who are born criminals, that is, born with such a decided tendency toward criminal acts that the slightest influence of environment may and often does serve to kindle into a blaze the undesirable and criminal characteristics dr salibi says of this in the face of the work of lombroso and his school exaggerated though some of their conclusions may be we cannot dispute the existence of born criminals and the criminal type. There are undoubtedly many such persons in modern society. There is an abundance of crime with no education, practiced or imaginable, would eliminate. Present-day psychology and medicine, and, for the matter of that, ordinary common sense, can readily distinguish cases at both extremes, the matoid or semi-insane criminal at one end, and the decent citizen who yields to exceptional temptation at the other end. End of quote. The eugenists quote as an instance of the above contention the celebrated case of Max Jukes, a notorious criminal and drunkard, who, as the records show us, was the ancestor of a foul brood of descendants which cost the state of new york over a million dollars in seventy-five years among these descendants were two hundred thieves and murderers two hundred eighty-five subject to idiocy blindness or deafness ninety prostitutes and three hundred children born prematurely it is possible that a portion of this evil result was caused not alone by bad heredity, but, at least in part, by the suggestion of the environment and the influence of example of the parents. But even so, the primal cause was that Max Jukes, 
the notoriously unfit ancestor was allowed to propagate this evil brood, destined to be born and reared under the most adverse conditions and environment. The eugenists also place great importance upon the prevention of insane persons becoming parents. To those who consider that this is but an exceptional and rare occurrence, the eugenists reply that a large percentage of insane patients in asylums have a family history showing insanity in one or both parents. That reports show that there are thousands of feeble-minded women in every large city allowed to, yes, often actually compelled to, bear children to their husbands or male companions. Ribot says, Every work on insanity is a plea for heredity. Maudsley says, more than one-fourth and less than one-half of all insanity is heredity. Riddle says, Of the great causes of insanity, alcoholism is perhaps the greatest, while morbid heredity ranks next. Insanity is largely the result of degeneracy. Most persons who become mentally deranged are the offspring of neurotic, drunken, insane, or feeble-minded parents. End of quote. While it by no means follows that one must manifest traits of insanity or mental disturbance simply because one of his parents suffered from a like trouble, and we believe that many a one has frightened himself into those conditions by pure autosuggestion, inspired by a one-sided belief in heredity. Still, it is unquestionably true that a fair mind must concede that wisdom and a proper sense of right and justice would require that parents of unsound mental tendencies should not be permitted to bring into the world children who might inherit a tendency toward a like or worse condition. The eugenists also have called the attention of the thinking public to the danger of deaf and dumb persons transmitting their condition to their offspring. Of this, Dr. Salibi says, The condition known as deaf mutism is congenital or due to innate defect in about one half of all the cases in Great Britain. End of quote. Dr. Love says, in every institution, examples may be found of deaf-mute children who have had one or two deaf parents or grandparents, and of two or more deaf-mute children belonging to one family. End of quote. A case is noted in England where a deaf and dumb man, having been killed by an accident, his relatives could not identify the body, as the wife and sister were blind, deaf and dumb, and the four children were deaf and dumb. The man and his wife were both deaf and dumb when they were married, the wife being also blind. Perhaps no subject has aroused the active eugenists to a greater pitch of indignation than the ascertained results of the effort upon offspring of parents addicted to the overindulgence in alcohol. It is known by the records that a large number of cases of feeble-mindedness and actual insanity are due to inebriety of parents, and often of grandparents, or ancestors for several generations. Epilepsy, idiocy, and criminality are also traceable in many cases to drunkenness of parents. Dr. Salibi moved by indignation by the ascertained results of the investigations of the eugenists, has said, Parenthood must be forbidden to the dipsomaniacs, the chronic inebriate, or the drunkard, whether male or female. End of quote. Professor Grignier, writing on the subject of alcoholic degeneration, has said, Alcohol is one of the most active agents in the degeneracy of the race. 
The indelible effects produced by heredity are not to be remedied. Alcoholic descendants are often inferior beings, a notable proportion coming under the categories of idiots, imbeciles, and the debilitated. The morbid influence of parents is maximum when conception has taken place at the time of drunkenness of one or both parties. Those with hereditary alcoholism show a tendency to excess. Half of them become alcoholics. A large number of cases of neurosis have their principal cause in alcoholic antecedents. The larger portion of the sons of alcoholics have convulsions in early infancy. Epilepsy is almost characteristic of the alcoholism of parents when it is not an index of a nervous disposition of the whole family. The alcoholic delirium is more frequent in the descendants of alcoholics than in their parents, which indicates their intellectual degeneration. End of quote. What has been said of alcoholism, of course, applies to the use of narcotics and other drugs. Galton cites a case in which a man, who had two healthy children, acquires the cocaine habit and, while suffering from the symptoms of chronic poisoning, engendered two idiots. End of quote. And yet, had anyone publicly instructed the wife of this man regarding the use of contraceptives, such person would have been liable to imprisonment. Another subject engaging the active attention of the eugenists, and which is discussed to considerable extent in the privacy of their meetings, but which must be voiced only very carefully in the public prints, owing to the murderous silence which society prefers to maintain on the subject, is of the influence of venereal diseases as racial poisons transmissible to offsprings. Dr. Salibi has well said, no other disease can rival syphilis in its hideous influence upon parenthood and the future. But it is no crime for a man to marry, in fact his innocent bride and their children, no crime against the laws of our lawgivers, but a heinous outrage against nature's decrees, when at least our laws are based on nature's laws, criminal marriages of this kind may be put an end to. End of quote. The above stated facts are not pleasant reading for most persons, and many pass over them hurriedly thereby hoping to escape the mental discomfort which the hearing and learning of unpleasant truths so often produce. But the subject will not down. It is forcing itself to the attention of the thinking members of society today in a manner which will admit of no escape. These facts must be faced and steps must be taken by society to protect the race from degeneration and actual race suicide. And the silence of eugenics is pointing the way. Dr. Salibi says of this phase of eugenics, Negative eugenics will seek to define the diseases and defects which are really hereditary, to name those the transmission of which is already known to occur and to raise the average of the race by interfering as far as may be with the parenthood of persons suffering from these transmissible disorders. Only thus can certain of the gravest evil of society, as for instance feeble-mindedness, insanity, and crime due to inherited degeneracy, be suppressed. And if race culture were absolutely incapable of effecting anything whatever in the way of increasing the fertility of the worthiest classes and individuals, its services in the negative direction here briefly outlined would be of incalculable value. To this policy we shall most certainly come, but here, as in other cases, I trust 
far more to the influence of an educated public opinion than in legislation, though there are certain forms of transmissible disease, inferring in no way with the responsibility of the individual, the transmission of which should be visited with the utmost rigor of the law, and regarded as utterly criminal, no less than sheer murder. End of quote. But the science of eugenics is concerned not only with telling society what not to do, it is equally concerned with telling it what to do. It has its positive as well as its negative side. After pointing out the evils of procreation on the part of the unfit, it then proceeds to tell the fit how to best serve the interests of the unborn. Eugenics is not satisfied with merely plucking out the foul weeds which have encumbered the fair garden of life. It seeks also to furnish to the real flowers better soil and empowered conditions as to give them the benefit of the best selection, breeding, and conditions that they may evolve and improve into still more glorious products of nature's power. The eugenists earnestly advocate laws and public opinion tending to protect mothers and expectant mothers. They recognize the supremacy of motherhood and aim to encourage and protest it. They decry the common indifference toward this function which is all important in the preservation and evolution of the race and which neglect is well expressed in the complaint of Bouchacourt, who said, the dregs of the human species, the blind, the deaf-mute, the degenerate, the imbecile, the epileptic, are better protected than are pregnant women. End of quote. The eugenists believe in educated women for motherhood and in protecting them from conditions which interfere with that important function of their life. They are not fully agreed upon the methods to be pursued in cases of expectant mothers whose lack of proper support prevents them from obtaining the proper nourishment, etc., but in a general way it may be said that they agree in holding that the expectant mother should be looked upon as the honored ward of the state and should be properly provided for from the public funds. The eugenists also believe in educated the father, or prospective father. They hold that every man should be made acquainted with the duties and responsibilities of fatherhood, and should so conduct and order his life that the production and rearing of a family should result as a consummation of a long-cherished ideal. The man should be taught to prepare himself physically, mentally, and morally, for his coming responsibility to the race. He should also be taught to respect and regard motherhood, and to make it his business to secure and preserve the best possible conditions for the mother of his own children, and the mothers of other men's children, not as an act of mere sentiment, but as a public duty, a patriotic service, a racial obligation. The eugenists believe in teaching young men and young women on the subject of sexual psychology and physiology. They hold that the race is now criminally negligent in such matters, and that young men and women, by the thousands, enter into the state of marriage and parenthood with no knowledge regarding the sacred functions which they are to bring into activity. They believe that the first requisite of scientific parenthood is and must be a sane knowledge of the physiology of sex and the psychology of sex. There must be sane education concerning the sexual organism, its laws, its functions, its normal and healthy condition, its anatomy, physiology, and hygiene. The average physician of several years' experience, can tell tales of almost incredible ignorance on the part of persons who have recently entered into the relationship of marriage. In some cases, 
The ignorance is more than a mere absence of knowledge, for it consists of an array of false knowledge, untruthful ideas, of often serious importance. It is sad enough to think how the ignorance and false knowledge may work results hurtful to the young couple themselves. But it is even sadder to realize that these same ignorant or wrongly informed young persons must gain their real knowledge through sad experience, which is to be paid for not only by themselves, but also by their children. It is a hard saying, but true, that the knowledge of the majority of young parents is gained by experience paid for by their unborn children. The eugenists look forward to the coming of the day when it will be regarded as reprehensible to allow young persons to enter into the relationship of marriage without a sane practical knowledge of their own reproductive organisms and functions and of their physiological duties to themselves their companions in marriage and to their children born or to be born we may in due time see a practical realization of the ideal set forth by dr newell dwight hillis who said quote, the state that makes a man study two years before a license as druggist is given that makes a young lawyer or doctor study three years before being permitted to practice. Ought to ask the young man or young woman to pass an equally rigid examination before license is given to found an American home and set up an American family. End of quote. This idea of the scientific preparation for parenthood is a new one for many but the coming generations will recognize its importance to the individual and to the race. Many who recognize the influence of prenatal culture in so far as is concerned the physical, mental, and moral conditions of the mother during pregnancy have failed to perceive that an equally important influence is exerted by the physical, mental, and moral conditions of both parents before the conception of the child. These conditions are reflected, often very markedly, in the child, and an avoidance of consideration in this respect is often almost criminal negligence. Eugenists deplore the haphazard way in which children are so often conceived. More care is often bestowed upon the conditions precedent to the conception of the domestic animals than is given by their owners to the conditions preceding the conception of their own offspring. Too often, while in the case of the domestic animals, the utmost care is exercised regarding the arrangement for the breeding of valuable stock, the human offspring are merely accidents, conceived without intention, for thought or preparation, and too often is such conception undesired, regretted, and unwelcome. The state of affairs is utterly unworthy of civilized man with the knowledge of science at his command and the intellect and the will with which to carry out the plain dictates of reason and duty. Nature does her part unhindered in the case of the lower animals, and man should use his principles as a foundation upon which to build a structure which reason and intelligence should supply the materials. Instead of this, man too often discards nature's plan rules entirely, and also refuses to use his reason, and, instead, allows himself to be ruled by selfish inclinations and desires and ignoble motives. To those who may ask, but why should we give all this time, care, and trouble to the young of the race? What is their claim upon us that demands so much of us in return for so little on their part? End of question. The answer is plain. 
We should do this not alone because of the natural feeling of love for our own offspring which is innate in all normal human beings, but we should also do this because we owe a duty to the race in and which we are units, a duty which demands that we supply to the race the best material and only the best for its preservation, continuance and betterment. The spirit of the age is pointing out the direction indicated by eugenics and scientific birth control. And it is a spirit in which the best mental and spiritual powers of man are called into action. A new consciousness, the race consciousness, is awakening with the best of the race. And accompanying it is a new conscience, a race conscience is manifesting within us and is giving the individual a sense of right and wrong toward future generations just as his earlier awakened social conscience has opened his eyes to his duties toward his neighbors man is beginning to feel that all men are his brothers and that the future generations of men are in a sense his children the new ideal of let us build posterity worthily has begun to supplant the old narrow idea humorously expressed in the famous bull of sir boyce roche who said why should we do anything for posterity what has posterity ever done for us as dr salibi has well said in the struggle toward individual perfection be religious so assuredly is the struggle less egoistic indeed toward racial perfection and they that shall be of us shall build up the old waste places for we shall rise up the foundations of many generations End of quote. and in all this also we find ever present the distinctive note of modern thought that is not more children but better ones not more birth but less deaths and more survivals not numerical birth values but qualitative birth values and numerical survival values End of Lesson 6 Recorded by Mark Chulsky in Massachusetts